name's Wes. And today, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite things. Now, when you talk about a portrait lens, what is a portrait lens? Well, let's find a definition. A portrait lens is any lens that has the right focal length and aperture to take exceptional portrait photos. An ideal portrait lens focal length is between 70 to 135 millimeters. Let's look at some portraits. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh yeah. Get that compressed background, that shallow depth of field. Boring. Okay, yeah, sure, these are fun pictures. They're pretty pictures. But does a portrait lens need to be 70 to what many would say 200 millimeters? I would like to say no. A lens is a lens, a picture is a picture, and a picture of a person that expresses them in some way is still a portrait. So whether that's at 200, 300, 600 meters, millimeters, or what about ultra wide? If you followed my work, some people who follow my work in a peripheral manner have accused me of being addicted to bokeh. And apparently they haven't even been to my website because a large part of my portfolio is ultra wide angle portraiture. And so let's talk about that today. And I'm going to give you my six tips for taking great wide angle portraits. Now, as in with any sort of photography, these are just my tips. They help me get by, but there are so many ways to get the job done, which honestly is why we're talking about wide angle portraits. So number one, it's framing. Look at me in this rule of thirds right here. Oh, that's so good. But the rule of thirds all of a sudden, it's kind of difficult when you're shooting ultra wide. I'm gonna be showing you a lot of image samples here and just so I don't have to tag them all, Every single one of them is somewhere between 16 and 20 millimeters. 90% of them are actually at 16 millimeters. That's as wide as my usual portrait lens, the Sony 16 to 35 GM goes. And I love shooting it wide. So when you're framing a shot, but you're ultra wide, the easiest thing to do, and the safest thing to do, is to get your subject right in the middle of it. Now, some people would say this is boring and that it causes some sort of uh, subconscious antagonism with the photo that creates a tension between whatever. You can still make a photo that is center framed that looks great. It just depends on your composition a bit. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. But to keep things safe, because of the way that you get distortions, and most wide angle lenses can't really handle distortions that well around the edges, you want to, at least initially, keep your subjects near the center of the frame. In that way, you'll minimize your distortions and don't get too, too close to them. The closer you get, the harder it is gonna to be to manage these distortions and to keep your subjects looking not like aliens. Number two, and this is something that the whole bokeh addiction issue really is now failing to teach photographers is the background. The background, when you're shooting ultra wide, it doesn't matter what your aperture is, it's gonna be mostly in focus. So you have to think about your background and your foreground and how that relates to your subject. So all of a sudden, if your subject is in front of a busy background or a background with like colors to them or their outfit or their skin tone, they're just gonna disappear in a mess. Now this is something that photographers used to learn right from the get-go because they would be shooting in black and white. Yes, that was a long time ago. But in black and white, you need to have contrast for your image to pop, for your subject to take prominence. So when you're shooting an ultra-wide portrait, you need to constantly be thinking about what's behind of in front of your subject so that they can frame them. Now, one great thing about this is that you can use it to your advantage. With an ultra-wide lens, converging lines become much more prominent. And so everyday items like railings and buildings and streets or anything, all of a sudden are much less straight and linear. They're much more convergent. And you can use these devices to much more easily point to your subject and create a compelling image. One trick and tip that I have, if you have a mirrorless camera, you can set your creative mode to black and white. Your raw images will still have full color, but your image preview will be black and white. And this will help you get a feel for whether or not your subject is actually going to be isolated in any way and be given any sort of prominence and interest in your photo. 
Number three, your angle. This one moves on a bit from all of them. Of course, they're all going to be interrelated. When you're shooting at an ultra-wide angle, if you shoot down or shoot up, how your subject is perceived will change dramatically. If you shoot up, all of a sudden, their legs will be very, very long, and their head is going to be very, very small. Now, you can use this and play with it, but for the most part, if you're trying to create a flattering image, you're going to want to try to stay as straight on as you can to your subject. Don't go too high, don't go too low. Moving right along is your arrangement. And similarly to our composition and framing, if you are shooting two people, all of a sudden things get more complicated. With a normal portrait lens, say up to 200 millimeters, if, say, you have a bride and a groom, or just a couple, and one of them is a little bit closer to you, they might be out of focus, but they won't look weird. What do I mean by weird? Well, with an ultra-wide shot, if one of your subjects is a tiny bit closer to you, all of a sudden, they are a lot bigger than the other person in the frame. Very subtle differences can make this an enormous change. So, where you have two people who are about the same size as each other, all of a sudden, if you shift one back and one forward a bit, one becomes much larger than the other. Some people won't find this flattering. Now, it's up to you to decide what to do with that tool, either for good or for evil. In the same way, though, you can have objects in the foreground or background that you have purposefully made larger or smaller. So, what I like to do sometimes is I'll actually put my camera right down in the grass or the dirt, flip the screen up, and then I'll be shooting through the grass and the debris and the flowers and the plants, and all of a sudden, you end up with this Robdingnagian atmosphere, maybe Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is more familiar, where the objects around them are huge and larger than life and the subjects are framed inside them. That can be a lot of fun. So don't just be afraid of this, but just be aware of the arrangement front to back of your shots and you can use that for fun or use that to your advantage. Number five, the environment. This is my favorite part of ultra wide angle portraiture. When you take this ultra-wide shot, all of a sudden, you're not just catching what's in the general area of your subjects. You can catch the entire swath of the sky above them, the ground and the forest around them. When you take a picture below 20 millimeters, all of a sudden, the sky becomes this living, breathing entity, a part of the photo that imbues it with this pathos that's just gorgeous. Now, I know, maybe, maybe I'm getting a little too excited about this, but hey, I'm a photographer, I'm allowed to get excited about this. And so all of a sudden, the atmosphere and the environment around them can become a much more active part of the picture. Now for sure, when you're taking a picture with a normal portrait focal length, this can be the case too. But it almost becomes a requirement at this point for you to really think about the environment and what it says and what it adds to the picture that you're taking. Say you're taking a picture on a stormy day, when you do this ultra-wide shot, it's going to be really hard to ignore that. So you kind of have to work it into the shot and make it all consistent and work together. And it can be a beautiful thing to be able to take it all in all at once. And then finally, rule number six is once you have all these rules down and you've gotten used to taking these ultra-wide pictures with people in them, throw out all the rules and start making really interesting things. Once you're aware of what happens when things are closer to the edges of the frame, closer to the camera, you can start breaking the rules and having more and more fun with it. As you can see in these ballet shots, ballet dancers are often larger than life individuals. I'm not meaning that in an unflattering way, I mean the way that they move and their limbs and their skills and proficiency. And so if you take a picture like that, it really brings out the drama and the scope of the dance, even though you're just taking one individual shot. And so, once you have an awareness of all of this that's going on, as with many things, then comes the time to break the rules and really break the mold and do some great experimentation. I don't really recommend experimenting with it when you're not fully aware of what's going on in your photos already, but you'll get there and you'll be able to have a great time and take some great images. If you have any questions or comments about what I said here, if you have some more rules or rules to break for ultra-wide photography, let me know down in the comments. I'm always hanging out there. So, until next time, go take some ultra-wide photos.